a message from your scribe. Retirement. The long-awaited dream of those still working is simultaneously a capricious friend that one must constantly care for, so that when it finally arrives, it proves to be pleasant or at the very least, bearable. Many of us today do not think about how to improve our future existence, even though we have a variety of financial instruments to choose from, which people in ancient Rome could only dream of. Humans inexorably march towards old age, but is there a specific age threshold beyond which a person can undeniably be labelled as elderly? Scholars of classical civilizations endeavoured to answer this question and delineated various boundaries for the stages of a human's life. If we were to ask Cicero, he would tell us that a person could be considered elderly at the age of 46, a view shared by Livy and Horace. On the other hand, Hippocrates established the age at which maturity transitions into old age at 56. The Greek physician, who himself lived to a nearly century, according to different accounts, would have considered himself to have enjoyed a healthy and long life. That's as far as opinions go, but let's delve into the facts. In Sparta, the Gerontes, who were part of the Gerousia, also known simply as the Council of Elders, had the right to become members of this esteemed assembly once they reached the age of 60. Even soldiers were enlisted until they reached the age of 60 or in rare cases 65. This situation was different in Roman legions, where soldiers usually served for the period of 25 years, retiring much earlier than Spartans, often in their fifth decade of life. The Roman proverb goes as follows, Sexagenarius de Ponte dei Cioportet, translated as the 60-year-olds must be pushed off the bridge. This saying may have originally referred to a brutal ritual of disposing of the elderly, but during the early Republic its meaning was quite different. Roman believed that the older individuals should be stripped of their voting rights, because they simply were not interested in decisions regarding long-term goals. They wouldn't live to see the consequences of those decisions, so their voices should not matter. That's the theory, but in practice, as Rome aged from one century to the next, it was often the elderly who held the most significant positions. Although the division into juniores and seniores was set at 46 years of age, many older individuals frequently occupied seats in the Senate. It is not without reason that many researchers have attempted to derive the etymology of the word senator from the Latin senex, meaning an elder or an old man. In the ancient world there were few certain things, death, taxes and retirement? Only soldiers in the Roman Empire could count on the last of these certainties, thanks to changes in the structure of the military. From the late Roman Republic period through the days of the Roman Empire the Roman army was fully professional. Men who aspired to becoming soldiers volunteered for service. The length of service varied, ranging from 16 to 25 years. Soldiers who entered service not only anticipated a privileged position in society, but also looked forward to rewards that would await them upon retirement. After completing their service, every soldier was entitled to well-deserved rest and a range of other benefits. The most modest retirement benefits were available to soldiers known as auxiliares, which were recruited from various nations including Goths, Vandals and Germanic peoples. After 25 years of service, the entire unit would receive a Diplomata Militaria, which was essentially a work certificate, often inscribed on bronze tablets. These documents had a standardized structure and included the title of the Emperor who issued the document, signatures of witnesses, as well as the privileges granted to retired soldiers. These privileges included a one-time payment of a thousand denarii and Roman citizenship. Legionaries, depending on their rank upon retiring, could expect much higher payouts. Augustus, in the early years of the Common Era, regulated these payments, which he did not forget to mention in his autobiography, titled The Deeds of the Divine Augustus. He created a special fund to cover salaries and retirement for soldiers, initially funded from his own private resources, and later supplemented through taxation. From this period, retiring soldiers typically received a one-time financial allowance and, more importantly, land. A legionary could count on an allowance of 3,000 denarii and land in one of the Roman provinces. On the other hand, higher-ranking Praetorians were granted land in Italy and received the payment of 5,000 denarii. Considering that the legionary salary during Augustus' time was 225 denarii per year, soldiers received the equivalent of about 13 years of salary, along with the land, the value of which is hard to assess precisely. 
If we take into account the customary deductions from the salary for equipment and food, which were typically 70 and 50 denarii respectively at the time, the retirement received by veterans becomes the equivalent of not 13, but 28 years of service. However, to qualify for an honorable discharge, one had to complete the full term of service. A soldier who left even a year earlier was not entitled to any of the privileges due to his comrades, who remained in the army until the end. The only exception to this rule was the soldier's health. Soldiers who, due to health reasons, were unable to continue their service, could receive an honorable discharge. To qualify for this, a judge and a doctor had to issue a verdict. These individuals were often brought in from outside to prevent circumvention of the system through bribery, although this sometimes proved insufficient. During the time of Caracalla, soldiers who had served for at least 20 years could receive such a pension. Others had to agree to reductions in their final payments, depending on their length of service. In addition to the land grant and monetary benefits, retired soldiers were also rewarded with an emeritum, which included additional privileges. The bestowal of various privileges, often related to taxation, was just as significant and meaningful as the financial benefits. Veterans were exempted from all public services. This was significant exemption because Romans generally detested such city duties. It was unpaid service, periodically performed for the city, with a wide range of tasks including heavy construction, mining, woodworking, as well as police work and financial contributions to the city, usually paid in kind. In addition to exemption from civic duties, veterans and their families were also exempt from road tolls and trade taxes. The granting of these privileges depended on the current needs and the state capabilities. Generally speaking, after completing their service, soldiers still remained one of the most privileged social groups. Upon retirement, soldiers did yet one important thing from perspective of a state. Since the land assigned to them was often located in the same province where they had previously served, not in their hometown, retirees did not reintegrate with their local population. Instead, they became a strong romanizing element in the province. The properties of former soldiers often neighbored each other, and the daughters of soldiers were frequently married to fellow veterans. Those who were already Roman citizens sometimes engaged in political or administrative activities within the province, but auxiliares tended to stay away from these roles because despite decades of service in the Roman army, the civilian administration's management style could still seem somewhat foreign to them. Additional reasons for this situation could include social ostracism. It is worth remembering that Romans considered themselves highly civilized, and people from other ethnic groups often engaged in herding or semi-nomadic lifestyles were often treated with a certain degree of condescension, sometimes even taking the form of xenophobia. Former soldiers typically focused on running agricultural estates or establishing small businesses, making use of the privileges granted to them. According to various estimates, the percentage of veterans involved in the public life in towns and settlements in the Pannonian Basin or Germania did not exceed 6%. They led peaceful retirement, not concerning themselves with high politics. Their financial benefits and saved money were sufficient to buy one or two slaves and enjoy a long life in one of the Roman provinces. Their lives could only be disrupted by summons from the current legion commander, who needed additional soldiers in an unexpected situation. However, even then, retirees had the right to refuse. One of the most well-known stories of such a return to service is found in Livy's account. Lucius Quinctius, the sole hope of the empire of the Roman people, cultivated a farm of four acres on the other side of the Tiber, which is called the Quinctian Meadows, exactly opposite the place where the dockyard now is. There, whether leaning on a stake while digging a trench or while plowing, at any rate, as is certain, while engaged on some work in the fields after mutual exchange of salutations had taken place, being requested by the ambassadors to put on his toga and listen to the commands of the Senate, with wishes that it might turn out well both for him and the Commonwealth. He was astonished and, asking whether all was well, bade his wife Rasilia immediately bring his toga from the hut. As soon as he had put it on and came forward after having first wiped off the dust and sweat, the ambassadors congratulating him united in saluting him as dictator. They summoned him into the city and told him what terror prevailed in the army. Lucius, also called Cincinnatus, was the only talented tactician whom the Romans would decide to entrust with military command in Rome's darkest hour. It turned out that the Roman legion under the command of consul Minucius was surrounded by enemies. Cincinnatus was the only hope, so he was proclaimed dictator during the Senate meeting. Our hero gathered an army, rescued Ali Darmis on the battlefield, 
and then, after only 16 days, resigned from the office of dictator and returned to his farm. In the times we are here talking about, so around the first century, shortly after the Augustinian reforms, the cost of food for one person per year did not exceed 100 denarii, and if we change Rome with less crowded towns somewhere in the provinces, we will probably cover not only food supply cost, but the total cost of living in 100 denarii. Not a very lavish life, but who told you that living in ancient times would be easy, right? Therefore, regardless of whether the future retiree was a soldier, a craftsman, or an ordinary farmer, each of them invested in a unique and relatively reliable policy. Namely, the offspring. Even today, many people still hope for the glass of water at the end of their lives, given by their son or daughter, but it is the pension systems and relatively safety at the old age provided to some extent by today's states that are indicated as one of the factors causing demographic problems. Today, we simply do not need children to achieve safety, because it can be provided by the state or the funds that we save during our lifetimes. In ancient Rome, most people simply had to rely on savings, family support or simply work until they died. There is no room for further discussion here, the only pension system was the one that soldiers could count on. The rest were at the mercy of their family or hoped to achieve financial independence. We will not talk about businessmen whose income was constantly increased by successful enterprises, but at the end we can mention a thing about people who also retired from work in Rome, and often earlier than the soldiers, and we are talking about athletes. Wrestlers, gladiators and chariot riders earned huge amounts of money during the sports events held in various arenas of the empire. Just like today, the athlete's path was not at all easy, but one of the most straightforward to wealth and, at the same time, a peaceful old age. Gaius Apuleius Diocles, who lived in the 2nd century, during his 24-year career accumulated a fortune of nearly 9 million denarii, which corresponds, according to various estimates, to at least several billion euros. However, after retiring to an estate in the city of Praneste, he died only a few months later after retirement, therefore he enjoyed neither his wealth nor his free time. Romans really waited for the retirement. A centurion named Servius Sulpicius Similis served in the army during the times of Hadrian and Trajan. He was a highly valued soldier who was also in close company with emperors. His career gained momentum to such an extent that he was even appointed Praetorian Prefect and Prefect of Egypt. But Servius was already tired. He asked Hadrian to let him retire and when he finally succeeded, he spent the last seven years of his life retired and enjoying life somewhere in Egypt. Similis wanted to be free from professional life so much that he did not forget to mention it in his grave epitaph. Here lies Similis. He existed for many years and lived for seven years. If you enjoyed the video, please consider leaving a like and subscribing to the channel.